The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, something dire has happened. A freak accident. I heard Christian screaming. A young man takes a bullet in the head. Connor had been shot in the face. The dire prognosis. That boy is more than likely going to be a vegetable the rest of his life. And the remarkable recovery. Good things can happen with God on your side. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Let's go to the CBN News Desk for today's top stories. Gordon, another record high of new coronavirus cases for a single day in the U.S. at 50,000. Now 40 percent of the country has either stopped or walked back reopening plans because of the disease just before the 4th of July weekend. But there is good news in the race to develop a vaccine. Mark Martin brings us the story. California is one of the states seeing a rise in COVID-19 cases, reporting nearly 10,000 new cases Wednesday. Bars, restaurants, and movie theaters in 19 counties have new restrictions under orders from the governor. Bottom line is the spread of this virus continues uh, at a rate that is particularly concerning. Hospitalizations are on the rise in 25 states, and the number of deaths is increasing in 14. Government officials are hoping residents will follow guidelines this Independence Day weekend. On the East Coast, New York's mayor is putting a stop to plans to allow indoor dining. Even a week ago, honestly, I was hopeful we could, but the news we have gotten from around the country gets worse and worse all the time. Arizona saw another record spike. Vice President Mike Pence wore a mask as he arrived in Phoenix Wednesday. President Donald Trump told Fox Business, I'm all for masks. I think masks are good. Areas of the country making the wearing of masks mandatory include Miami-Dade County in Florida, where in all public spaces, facial coverings will be required. A Miami nurse told ABC News that patients she's seeing are more critical than before. And what about a vaccine? There are positive signs for one in the next year. Pfizer just announced strong results in trials. They could proceed to their next phase with the help of 30,000 volunteers in coming weeks. And Oxford's trials are in phase three, meaning emergency doses of a vaccine could be ready as early as October if it's discovered to be safe and effective. Moderna is also about to launch phase three of vaccine trials. Mark Martin, CBN News. CBN News medical reporter Lori Johnson is here with us now. So, Lori, so much attention is being paid to the dramatic rise in COVID-19 infections in dozens of states. But are we seeing the death rate jump as well? Actually, no, we're seeing the death rate dramatically down in so many places across the country, Ephraim. You talk about a place like Georgia, for example, where the number of cases, the number of positive cases and infections is way up, but the death rate is down to a three-month a three month low. We're talking about 15 deaths per day compared to a high of 43 deaths per day. That's in Georgia. So we really don't see a lot of news stories about the fact that the death rate is much lower in many parts of the country, while at the same time, the number of positive cases, uh, the number of positive infections is way up. So, Lori, how do health experts now explain the increase in the number of cases while at the same time the death rate decreasing? Right. A lot of people are confused by that, that number. The, the cases are up, the deaths are down. And health uh, experts say that there are, there, it's probably one of three explanations, perhaps a little of all three. Number one is we might actually see the death rate go up because of this increase in cases. We know that when a person dies of COVID-19, they were usually diagnosed with it four weeks earlier on average. So we're going to be looking very carefully at the death rate within the next two to four weeks. Oftentimes a person becomes hospitalized on average two weeks after they were diagnosed. Although we do know that most of these new cases, Ephraim, are people who are young. And we know that young people typically do not die from COVID-19. There are some exceptions, but the vast majority of deaths are people over age 80, second uh, the 
group is age over 70 and so forth. So uh, we might not see that much of an increase in death rates. We hope that's the case. And then here's another possible explanation. The COVID-19 virus may have mutated to become less deadly. That would certainly be an answered prayer. Indeed, some critical weeks ahead. Some people question the cause of death for some people who are said to have died from COVID-19. Is it possible they've died from something else? This is a point of contention indeed, because you took, we, I mentioned before, most people who die from COVID-19 are over age 80. And uh, three fourths of people in the hospital who die from COVID-19 also have at least three comorbidities, these underlying health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, lung problems. And when a person is in great distress, there are lots of things going on. And so when the person ultimately dies, there is a question, was it the heart disease that killed him or was it some sort of the, the COPD, the lung problem? But they did have they did test positive for COVID-19. So a lot of times people will chalk it up to COVID-19 when there is some question that maybe it was one of these other conditions that ultimately caused their death. So, Lori, what about the reports of a possible vaccine? Any idea on whether we're really going to get one um, by the end of the year, as many are hoping? Yeah, it looks that way. There's good news on the vaccine front. Uh, now there are three leading contenders. One of them is in the United States, the Moderna with, in association with the National Institutes of Health. And this particular vaccine in human trials has shown that when you give it to a person, they produce enough antibodies to fight off the COVID-19. So now they're taking volunteers, 30,000 volunteers this month. And these are people in all different age ranges to see if it is if it has that same result on them and is if it is in fact safe and effective on those people but Ephraim new polls show that as many as a third of Americans say even if there is a safe and effective vaccine they're not going to get it and doctors are concerned about that because we need that herd immunity if it is safe and effective it still might be only 50 to 70 percent effective and doctors say we need lots of people to get that vaccine to protect our most vulnerable because the most vulnerable, the older people with those preconditions, they're the ones that the vaccine might not prove to be as effective on. All right, Lori Johnson, CBN News Medical Reporter, thank you so much again for your insight. Sure. President Donald Trump and top officials have stepped up their defense of the White House's response to intelligence reports Russia offered bounties for killing U.S. troops in Afghanistan. The president's national security advisor said he had prepared a list of retaliatory options if the intelligence proved to be true. The president says he was never told about the report, while Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Russian activity in that country is not out of the ordinary. The fact that the Russians are engaged in Afghanistan in a way that's adverse to the United States is nothing new. Pompeo says the U.S. took the situation seriously and that he often receives threat assessments that don't rise to the level of a presidential briefing. But lawmakers from both parties are still asking for more information on this intelligence. I want to turn now to Hong Kong. Tensions are high after China approved a contentious new national security law that has now gone into effect. It has already led to hundreds of arrests. Abigail Robertson brings us more on the shockwaves this law is sending through those fighting to keep Hong Kong's independence. This new national security law effectively strips Hong Kong residents of their freedom of speech and legal right to criticize Beijing's government. Yet thousands have already defied it, taking to the streets to protest and risking life imprisonment. <laughs> Police use water cannons to disperse crowds of protesters and arrested more than 300 people on the 23rd anniversary of the handover from Britain to China. Yesterday, the Chinese Communist Party implemented its draconian national security law on Hong Kong in violation of commitments that it made to the Hong Kong people. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo blasted the Chinese government for turning Hong Kong into another communist-run city. Security forces are already rounding up Hong Kongers for daring to speak and think freely. The rule of law has been eviscerated. And as always, the Chinese Communist Party fears its own people more than anything else.
The new law punishes crimes of secession, subversion, terrorism or collusion with foreign forces. Free Hong Kong was one of the world's most stable, prosperous and dynamic cities. Now it will be just another communist run city where its people will be subject to the party elite's whims. It's sad. In response, Pompeo says the U.S. is implementing visa restrictions on Chinese officials responsible for overturning the long-held freedoms of Hong Kong's residents. And Britain announced it will extend residency rights to up to 3 million Hong Kongers. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. A final decision on Israel's plans to annex the biblical lands of Judea and Samaria in the area known as the West Bank is expected next week. That is according to the Jerusalem Post. A vote was supposed to be taken in Israel on an annexation plan yesterday, but it was postponed. A knowledgeable source told the Post that Jerusalem and the Trump administration are expected to coordinate their decision over how Israel will move ahead with the plan of annexation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said he's still in talks with the United States. And the Israeli Regional Corporation minister said Israel will annex parts of the West Bank later this month, but not until President Trump makes his statement on the issue. Those are today's top stories from CBN News. Gordon and Terry are back with more Today's 700 Club right after this. Well, throughout history, the church has been a driving force behind social change. Today, community-driven congregations are still playing that role. CBN's Amber Strong takes us to Indianapolis, where churches are building bridges between neighborhoods and the police. Can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? Division between police in certain communities is nothing new. And while many enjoy an amicable relationship with law enforcement, social media shines a light on the division and broken trust. But in Indianapolis, members of the faith community and law enforcement hope to exchange vantage points and walk a mile in each other's shoes. All thanks to a program called One Cop. But one thing that's really unique and special about One Cop is that it's really focused on beat police officers. These are the people who, if they're doing their job correctly, are literally walking up and down the block. And it's something this community sees most every day. What they don't usually see is a nun in a police car, or police officers seated in pews during the week. Church leaders also get to try their hand at being officers, facing the challenge of split-second decision. The team at One Cop believes churches are uniquely positioned to break down any walls existing between the police and those they are sworn to protect. To walk the streets, I think with a police officer would be an eye-opening experience. Pastor Jim Wright jumped at the opportunity to be a liaison and perhaps more. Introducing them to the community and being a host site for the community would be a really good way of connecting the community with the police officers, with us as the bridge, and then, Lord willing, opening up the door to share the gospel. Local law enforcement are also eager to open doors and make a good first impression. If you commit a crime here in Indianapolis, you're likely to wind up here at the Marion County Jail, where you'll be greeted by a member of the Sheriff's Department. Well, local law enforcement are hoping to change all that and build a relationship with the community before they wind up in jail. Marion County Sheriff John Layton hopes renewing relationships can help cut down on counterproductive codes like no snitching. He also wants to create and build levels of respect. You shouldn't have to fear a uniform, ever fear a uniform, but please respect it. While Layton blames social media for the growing antagonism, he quickly admits mistakes have been made. There are tens of thousands of police officers across the United States. Every now and then one steps out of line. Sometimes it's a mistake of the head, sometimes a mistake of the heart. It's such a minuscule percentage of the police that are out there every day dodging bullets instead of sending them. Put your hand behind your back. Even a few, however, can deepen the divide. The 17-year-old lay prone on the pavement as the shots continued, 16 rounds in 14 seconds. The aftermath captured in graphic video and streamed live on Facebook by the man's girlfriend. In Texas, for example, tensions remain high after Dallas police officer Amber Geiger shot and killed 26-year-old faith leader Botham John inside his apartment. Community leaders there questioned why Geiger was able to stay on the job for so long after the shooting. 
Indianapolis crime reporter Steve Jefferson points out if and when incidents like this happen, transparency is important. He's seen it work so far in Indy. The ongoing relationship, which still needs a lot of work, you know, uh, has kept things from being explosive here in our city. He credits programs like One Cop and other faith-based initiatives for helping calm things down. Prevention is key and Jefferson adds that training goes a long way. Our department here in Indianapolis now actually teaches um, officers not to let their biases impact their work on the street. We all expect to be treated a certain way by the police and I think them knowing how to de-escalate a situation, whether it be a traffic stop, whether it be trying to ID a young black man who you think is trespassing. As a deacon himself, Jefferson knows the church can play a major role in building relationships. Pastors need to do is take advantage of their captive audience because if they can get the message to the parents of the children, then the children can get the message from the parents. Sheriff Layden is optimistic because mutual respect and basically living by the golden rule will successfully bring churches, the community, and law enforcement together. We can start respect again, not, not just for the uniform, but for the people in those churches. Amber Strong, CBN News in Indianapolis. Uh, community is the key word here. Uh, we've unfortunately gotten into an us versus them mentality. And whether that's the police thinking they're against the world, uh, against the perpetrator, or the community somehow thinking that they're against the police. Uh, we've got to come together and a church is a good place to start. Terry? Well, up next, an accidental shooting leaves a young man with a bullet lodged in his neck less than a centimeter from his spinal cord. In my 20 years of being in the fire service, um, I've responded to a handful of gunshot wounds, um, and none of them have survived. See how this man beats the odds after this. Connor Faulkner was hanging out with his two older brothers when something went very wrong. Suddenly, Connor was in a fight for his life. And that's when his brother Cody made a desperate call that rocked their parents' world. My phone rang and it was Cody on the line. And I answered it and there was no response from him. So I thought, you know, it just was an accidental dial. And then I heard the squeaking of the tennis shoes. And I heard the dog barking, and I heard Christian screaming, our third son. March 19th, 2016, three brothers, Christian, Connor, and Cody Faulkner, were spending the day at the family lake house in Cicero, Indiana, preparing for a gun show. I turned to Cheryl and I said, something dire has happened, something tragic. Something dire had happened. That day, Cody was cleaning his nine millimeter pistol when a round discharged, striking Connor. Our son Christian called and had said that Connor had been shot in the face and they are going to take him to the hospital. We called our pastor, I called my mom. We just said, get on prayer, there's been an accident. After the two brothers finally loaded Connor with his 6'2", 220 pound frame into their Jeep, they headed straight for the local fire station. I knew the first thing that we needed to do is get him out of the back seat of the Jeep and, and get him laying flat. I would say he was at that point in critical condition. Of course, I had no way of knowing that it hit his carotid artery. Chief Collar did know that time was not on their side. When his mental status started to deteriorate, I decided to do a, a procedure called RSI, which is rapid sequence innovation. It's where we give them the medication that basically paralyzes them uh, and they lose the ability to breathe. And at that point, we have to insert uh, an ET tube and breathe for him. Connor was then life flighted to St. Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis. I paused a minute and I said, honey, we've got to be ready to let Bubby, as Connor's nickname, go if Jesus is taking him home today. In my 20 years of being in the fire service, um, I've responded to a handful of gunshot wounds. 
um, and none of them has survived. When we were driving there, the Holy Spirit came upon me as I asked for Him to, and I started praying in tongues, which I had never done before, but I know the Bible says that in the time of need, when there's no earthly prayer, that I'll pray on your behalf, and I had such a peace. The Faulkners arrived at the hospital not knowing what to expect. They were in there trying to get Connor stable. And when we walked in right before, I just said, you know, Lord Jesus, I just need you, give me strength. When we first saw him in the emergency room, he hadn't been cleaned up. He was still in shock and the shaking or the tremors that he was having started to uh, worry me. Connor was taken to ICU in critical but stable condition. I was so joyful that he was still alive. And I was just kissing his bloody face and just thanking the Lord and just touching his body head to toe and just praying over him and speaking life like the Lord says. And one of the, my favorite verses is Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, give you peace and prosperity and not harm you. In this huge hospital of I'm not sure how many thousands of rooms, his room number in ICU was 2911. The Faulkners continued to ask for prayer from friends and family. Many of them showed up at the hospital throughout the night. The waiting room was surrounded with the love of our friends and family. And the next morning, a new nurse came in and said, uh, excuse me, sir, to, Chris was like sleeping on a little ottoman. She's like, you can't have all these people. Connor began to stabilize, but doctors were still concerned about the bullet, which had lodged in his neck less than a centimeter from his spinal cord. My thoughts are, could it move? Is he able to go on roller coasters and, and live life, you know, to its fullest? What can he can or can't do? And they can't say. Doctors decided they would rather leave the bullet where it was than risk doing surgery and hitting the spinal cord. Connor then began a rigorous rehabilitation program. A lot of therapy, a lot of pain. And he said it was harder than any football injury he'd ever gone through. Then, on Easter Sunday, 2016, Connor took his first steps. The room was just full of energy and, and buzzing with talk and uh, encouraging words as he actually stood up. I love the Lord so much beforehand, and I told him that as I'd go to the restroom in the middle of the night in the quiet of the hospital and just dance to the Lord and praise Him. How good He was. Over the next year, Connor made a remarkable recovery. The neurosurgeon said that boy is more than likely going to be a vegetable the rest of his life. And so I would like to go back and visit that neurosurgeon and shake his hand and, and tell him it, good things can happen with God on your side. Then one day, he felt something strange on his neck. He went to the hospital to have a nurse examine it. She said, well, it looks like the bullet is working its way out. The body has a way of expelling things that you know don't belong in it. And so, we, and I was like, how am I supposed to deal with this? A bullet coming out of my neck this slowly. The bullet eventually came out on its own, and Connor made a ring from it to help him remember God's goodness. You know, we all have a story to share. You know, each and every one of us can share what God's doing in our lives. The power of the name of Jesus and answered prayer, miracles still happen, and God loves each and every one of us. If, if I can get shot through the head and the face and neck and come out of it completely healed, then you know that there's a God and you know that He can be on your side. With determination and, and God on your side, there's absolutely nothing that you can't overcome. That is Jeremiah 2911 walking. <laughs> I mean, have you ever heard such a story? I've never heard that. That is, uh, that's, that's unbelievable. A, what a ring. Here he is. He's got a bullet uh, that's uh, just came out. Uh, you, you look, you hear this story and you go, well, yay, God, what a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We're going to pray for you. Before we pray, we've got some other miracles. Here's Carol Ann from Reading, Pennsylvania. She had arthritis 12 months ago. And she was watching the 700 Club one day, and Terry had this word. There's somebody else. You have arthritis in your hands. You can hardly open jars mm. or turn anything anymore. Just stretch your hands out. God is healing that condition completely for you. Well, Carol Ann claimed her healing. She stretched her hands out, and she went back to the doctor. 
And the doctor said, what did you do? And Carol Ann told her about the report. The 700 Club said she had a word of knowledge, and then her doctor is still monitoring her, but claims that this wow. is a miracle. So, yeah. Another yay God moment this morning or today. Well, this is Mary who lives in Snellville, Georgia. She discovered a spot on her leg two years ago and started to fear immediately. Her doctor gave her the bad news that it was malignant melanoma. Then one day she's watching this program and Gordon, you said, here's a word for skin cancers. Even the ones that have already spread, it's already multiplied through your body. God is healing you and he's setting you free from this disease. This wasting disease is leaving you now and the cells are going to reproduce normally. Just receive it in Jesus' name. Well, Mary claimed the healing by faith. Two days later, her doctor took another biopsy. Confirmation, the spot wasn't cancerous. Wow. wow. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord. God works miracles. Uh, what does it take for us to receive that? Well, we just have to believe. And so just say to yourself, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Uh, now, what are you believing in? Well, you're believing in Him, and you're believing that with Him, He takes away all our disease. He takes away all our, our infirmity. He takes it all away. That's what we're believing. Now, doctors are going to have reports. You say, okay, uh, here's, here's the report of the doctor, but whose report am I going to believe? I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. He takes it all away. If He can take a bullet out of somebody's neck, what can He do for you? Now, just start thinking that. He can do a lot. And so how big is that? How big is that possible for you? For nothing is impossible with God. How big is that? How big is God? And surround yourself with that thought. And let's pray. And here's a word we're going to claim. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. So Terry and I are going to agree. What I'm asking you to do is touch. Lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. We'll come into agreement touching it, and God will do it. Let's pray. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you right now, and we just ask for healing. We come boldly to your throne of grace, knowing that with you nothing is impossible. You have stretched out the heavens with your word. You have formed us wonderfully. And so we come to you and we ask for healing. We ask for conditions to be completely and totally healed. For you have borne away our sickness. You've carried away our infirmity. By your stripes, we are healed. We were healed 2,000 years ago. It's already done. So, in an act of faith, we lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. We say out loud to it, be healed and be made whole now in Jesus' name. Pain, leave my body now. Infirmity, leave my body. And I receive what God has for me now in Jesus' name. There's someone you've had clicking in your right jaw and you're just laying hands on it right now. And all of that clicking, all of that um, problem with chewing, all of that is leaving you. The jaw is literally being remade so everything will be normal and be perfect again in Jesus' name. Terry? There's someone else you have clicking in your right elbow. Uh, and it's, it's, it is painful and so annoying. God's healing that for you. That whole joint is just being completely reconfigured. Someone else with dry eyes, it's not just unpleasant. I mean, it actually is affecting your vision. Your eyes are so dry. Nothing you've taken has helped you, but today Jesus is healing your eyes. Um, there's someone, you're laying hands on both knees. You have problems with both of them. Uh, pain is very difficult for you to get up, very difficult for you to walk. In Jesus' name. Be healed yes. and be restored now. Someone else's problems with your right hip. Yeah. It's just not moving properly and it's very painful and you walk with a limp. God is healing you. He's restoring. He's making everything new again. Thank you, Lord. Someone else with a spinal cord where uh, it hasn't been severed, but it's been bruised and God is healing. He's able to take that away and restore sensation. Restore everything associated with it in Jesus' name. Be healed, 
be made whole. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. If you have received a miracle, let us know. Share your good report. Call us 1-800-700-7000. And, and remember, we're here for you. And if you need prayer, we believe in the pre prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer, that doesn't give up. So we're here for you, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's our honor to pray for you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, a mother and father fear for the lives of their younger children after their oldest dies from drinking polluted water. See how this family and their whole village receive living water. That's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. More statues of historical figures are coming down across America with more to come. In Virginia, work crews took down a massive statue of Confederate General Stonewall Jackson Wednesday along the famed Monument Avenue in the state capital of Richmond. And in Columbus, Ohio, the statue of Christopher Columbus was removed from City Hall Wednesday. It'll be packed in storage. And in Boston, the Art Commission has voted to get rid of the Emancipation Memorial commemorating President Lincoln's signing of the proclamation that ended slavery in America. Desert locusts have swarmed northwest Kenya by the millions and they're threatening to cut off the food supply in the African country if they are not controlled quickly. A Kenyan logistician on contract with, for the United Nations is looking for infestations to try to stop the locusts before they can fly. If left to feed and grow, the locusts will swarm and spread about 125 miles a day and breed a new and bigger generation of locusts. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. The two young children in our next story lived in constant fear of dying every time they took a sip of water. That's because their older sister had died from drinking contaminated water. Their parents lived with the same fear and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. The Ma family lives in a barren mountainous region where much of the time there's very little rain. For years, the only place they could find water was in potholes or muddy ponds miles from home. There's a lot of bacteria and lots of parasites in it. It's sour and hard to swallow. Yeah, I can't stand it. It's yellow and smells awful. I hate this dirty water. Mrs. Ma will never forget how her oldest daughter got an infection from drinking the bad water and died. Her intestines ruptured. I still remember her moaning. Daddy, please save me. After their daughter's death, the family was extra careful about boiling the water, but still scared to drink it. I was afraid that I might be tortured by it and die like my sister. The Ma's son was in the hospital with inflamed intestines several times. He got better, but there was always the threat of death. I made a wish from my heart that one day I wouldn't have to drink it anymore. Her wish came true when CBN came to their village and found out about the water problem. We quickly built cisterns for the Ma's and other families in the village. We also gave them water filters. I'll never forget seeing the clean water for the first time. The flavor, it's so sweet. Now my brother and I drink as much water as we want, and we don't worry about getting sick or dying. Thank you, CBN. Because of your love, we will always have good, clean water. And now the whole family has something else, too. When CBN shared the story of Jesus, I accepted him. And soon his wife and children did too. He brought us all peace, and I want everyone in my village to know Jesus. With your help, we have clean water for our bodies, 
And now we have living water that nourishes our souls too. It's hard to imagine what it's like to live without water to simply be able to drink, but think of all the other things you use water for in your life. Clean water is such a need all around the world. 700 Club members, you're providing that to people who are as desperate as the Maz every day of the week, and we want to say thank you. You know, this happens because we all link arms together, and we all say, let's make a difference in the lives of people who are in need. And when we do that together, we can impact powerfully villages, communities, even nations. So we say thank you. How do you link arms with us? Well, you join the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And you can do that right now by calling our toll-free line. Our number is 1-800-700-7000. It's there on your screen. Here's another way you can help us. When you call and you give, will you do it using Pledge Express? That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work. It's pretty wonderful. You don't have to remember anything, no stamps, no envelopes, it's all done for you. But it does save us some administrative costs that we can put even more into the lives of people like the Moz. And our way of saying thank you for using Pledge Express is to send you Power for Life teachings. You'll get one of these every month. We want to say thank you right now for all you're doing. And for those of you who are just joining the 700 Club, again, that number is 1-800-700-7000. Thank you in advance. Don't forget to say you want to do it using Pledge Express. Gordon? Well, up next, her name is Liberty, but not long ago, this young woman was anything but free. Something was holding me down and not, just not letting me up. And then I heard this really loud scream, like an evil, loud, wretched squeal. Here are the words that finally set her free after this. Well, at the age of 14, Liberty got off the school bus, walked home, and found all her belongings in a box on the front porch. Her mom had chosen her boyfriend over her, but not before she had exposed her daughter to the world of the occult. I shouldn't have been born. My own mother didn't want me. There must have been something wrong with me because Nobody wanted me, you know? Nobody wanted to raise me, love me, take care of me, let me be their daughter. Liberty grew up with deep feelings of rejection after her mother left her and her brother on their father's doorstep. She wanted to party, she wanted to, to do her thing, and she couldn't do that with two little babies. And so, you know, she just decided to give us up. After several turbulent years with her father, Liberty moved back in with her mom, who introduced her to drugs and alcohol. At a young age, her mother also exposed her to the occult. She always had a, a large bookshelf that was full of uh, witchcraft books with spells, chants, um, ways to curse people. She had tarot cards, a Ouija board, all that. Everything was, that was normal um, in my mom's household. When Liberty was 14, she had an argument with her mother's abusive boyfriend and found herself rejected again. I came home off the bus and there was a box of stuff sitting outside. There was a note that my mom had left that said, um, he's in, you're out. You have to find somewhere else to live. Now, this is my reality. My mom doesn't love me, she, she never wanted me, she doesn't care. She found acceptance in the party scene and had relationships with men who gave her a place to stay and supplied her with drugs. I did whatever I had to do to survive. I was alone, I was lost. The crystal meth and the drinking was very heavy. I mean, it was a daily thing. It wasn't just like, let's go party on a Friday night. I mean, it was every single day, drinking drugs, drinking drugs, staying up for days. She also began experiencing strange phenomena and some unsettling symptoms. I was hearing voices, I was seeing things. Um, I would get up in the night and I would feel like something was speaking to me and uh, was coming after me. I had sores, uh, little open sores around my body. A friend's parents set up a meeting with their pastor. Liberty reluctantly agreed to see him. I had no belief in God or 
spiritual beings or anything like that. And he basically just said, all these are symptoms of uh, a demonic attack on you. And the only way to deal with it is rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Days later, she had a terrifying encounter. These dark images began to just cover the walls and they were like enclosing in on me like they were coming after me. I did what the pastor said and I rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then the fear was gone and everything I was feeling was gone. It was literally just gone. The demons, everything just disappeared. Liberty says she learned there was power in the name of Jesus, but knew little else about him until a few days later when she was watching TV and came across the 700 Club. Pat Robertson says, you know, is there anyone watching by TV that, you know, if you'd like to ask Jesus into your life, um, pray this prayer with me. I just uh, felt like I needed this Jesus that could make demons flee. I don't have to wait to go to church and be called to the altar. I can just sit right here in my living room and accept Christ, you know. She surrendered her life to Christ, then fell into a deep sleep. When she awoke, she was in a struggle for her life. Something was holding me down and not, just not letting me up, not letting me speak. It feeling like a hand was over my mouth. I just began to say, Jesus. I was just trying to get the words out and I said, Jesus. It was very muffled, Jesus. And I felt like it was at the top of my lungs. And, and, and the thing that was covering my mouth just was slowly leaving, like letting go. The last thing I yelled was, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And at that moment, uh, whatever was holding me down removed itself. And then I heard this really loud scream, like an evil, loud, wretched squeal, it sounded as if it was leaving. It could no longer reside because Jesus was now the Lord of my life. Liberty knew she was free. She began to throw away anything that connected her to the darkness she once accepted as normal. I knew that the Lord was, was basically in that one moment cleaning up my whole life. He was just like, it's all gone. You know, I'm, I'm, you're letting it all go. I'm taking it all away from you. You're being set free. I finally was me. I was never me before. I was never, who's Liberty? You know, who, who's this, this girl that was born um, with no purpose, no value, um, no reason to live? He took everything out of me and healed me of, of all the, the horrible things that the world basically dished out on me. My life has changed forever because of that day. Today, Liberty co-pastors a church with her husband in Arizona, reaching out to people who need to be set free by the love of God. This is what I've been waiting for my entire life. And this is what it feels like to know a love that you never got, you never received before. I was born for a purpose and it's to serve Jesus Christ and to do his work. He's the only one that can set you free. He is the only one that can set you free, but the great news is he's great at it. His name is powerful. His presence is powerful. Demons have to flee. If you're tormented, if like Liberty, you're wondering what in the world is going on, what, what have I opened myself up to? And, and maybe it's not this, you know, tangible presence where you feel like you can't speak, but these strange things keep happening and keep happening and keep happening. And how do you get control over it? Well, do the same thing that Liberty did. Rebuke it in the name of Jesus and say you must flee at his name. You have no power here. You can't control me anymore. You can't put thoughts into my head anymore. You can't scare me anymore. You can't terrorize me anymore. You must leave. And when you take the authority that he freely gives you, and you find that in Luke chapter 10, behold, I give you power over all the things of the enemy. You have that power. 
All you have to do is use it. But here's the other thing that happened to Liberty. Here she's abandoned by her mother, not just once, but twice. And she, she grows up thinking, well, what's wrong with me? Why am I not lovable? What, what is it about me? Well, it was never about Liberty. It was always about her mother. And Liberty, just like you, fearfully and wonderfully made, and made for a purpose. When your parents abandon you, the Lord will always raise you up. He's right there. All he's waiting for is the invitation from you to come in, to be father, to be the one who loves you infinitely. If you'd like this, don't change the channel, but right now, do what Liberty did. She bowed her head. She prayed a very simple prayer. And from that prayer, her life changed. Now, was there a process? Yes. Will there be a process for you? Yes. But God has the answer. And to get that answer, all you have to do is ask. So bow your head with me. Let's pray that prayer. And today, let Jesus into your heart. What he's done for others, he will do for you. Pray with me. Jesus, that's right. Just say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus, I see what you have done for others, and I want that for me. So, Jesus, come into my heart. Make me new again. Forgive me of the things that I've done wrong. And, Jesus, I really want to know right now how much you love me. So show me, show up for me, and let me know that you're my Savior. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I pray a blessing on them. I pray you drive out every evil thought, every evil inclination, every evil spirit that has ever touched them. Put a hedge of protection around them. No power can ever overcome you. Free them right now, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. When you call, I've got a free packet for you. It's called A New Day. What do Christians do? What do you do now? How do you live the Christian life? It's all free. Here's a word from Corinthians. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. For all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again.